roll call. Councilor Holbrook? Here. Councilor Donovan? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor St. Clair? Here. Councilor Blaze? Here. Councilor Here. Chairman Sullivan? Here. Um, next on the agenda would be general public comments, three minutes, name and address. Anyone? Michael Turek, 11 Bay Berry Lane. I must speak early this evening because uh, I've got to return to some caretaker duties. Uh, Chairman Sullivan has assured me that the council not only listens but does heed the public comments, so here are mine. Tonight the council will take up order 14-80, request to replace the, to place the referendum question to purchase a new fire truck on the local ballot for the November 4th municipal elections. I'm urging you to reject this request. My reasoning follows. My understanding is that the present fire truck is going to be 25 years old and the replacement schedule calls for a new one. Replacement schedules are designed by people and can be misleading to the actual life of a product. My background is aircraft maintenance, aircraft logistics. And I understand that speaking to your audience is how you're supposed to speak, and you may not know a lot about airplanes, but please listen to this. When Lockheed Corporation built the U-2 aircraft in 1955, the replacement schedule called for a five-year lifespan because of the flimsy fuselage and wings. The replacements were introduced in 1968, 13 years later. The original aircraft flew for 30 years until 1985, mm -hmm. even though the replacements were still flying, or also flying. The 1968 aircraft had a 25-year lifespan and the replacement schedule to prove it. Engineers said that it could not fly more than 25 years. Those airplanes are flying today in critical areas supporting the war effort and they are 46 years old. When Boeing introduced the 707 in 1959, a similar story happened. The 707 is still flying today in different parts of the world. We in the United States have moved on to other aircraft, but I question whether we needed them or are we a throwaway society. When the United States embargoed Cuba, the flow of American autos into Cuba stopped. Cubans are still driving their 1955 Chevys. The town is now over $90 million in debt. I urge you, don't add to this burden. I think we all know that the voters will approve a new fire truck because they're afraid that if they don't have one, their safety will be in jeopardy. I think we should maintain the present fire truck and reduce our staggering debt. I know very little about fire trucks, but I do know a lot about logistics and a lot about replacement schedules. Please reject this request. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Any subject? Hi, Tina Christie, One Metalwood Drive in Scarborough. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Ms. Sinclair for her support and concern for the residents of this town. Um, I do agree that there are valid concerns that were raised regarding having adequate coverage in the event of an emergency. I do agree that that's critical. And I would also like to see much more information regarding other technologies that may be available to ensure the results that we're looking for. Um, and I also do appreciate Mr. Bacon's planning efforts in working with us, working with you. But last of all, I do want to make it very clear that regarding any kind of compromises about putting cell phone towers on top of utility poles, putting them in larger parcels of land, you know, putting them in less populated residential areas. 
I want to make it very clear, in case we haven't already, we do not want to see cell phone towers in residential areas whether they're densely populated or sparsely populated, or in RF zones, they belong in industrial zones. You know, I think Mr. Bacon may be missing that point. You know, just in case anybody's not clear on this, I think we've spoken. You know, what part of no don't you understand? <laughs> you know, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Suzanne Foley Ferguson, 331 Black Point Road. So, I'm um, first. I want to say that I I really appreciate the direction that the council is moving on in terms of the cell phone tower um, ordinance. I heard two two of the councilors talk about how there's still a lot of work to do, um, and then say that you know we have to work in the ordinance committee um, to do that. But then I heard the town manager say it's it's tabled and so action has to be taken at the next meeting and so then um, and while that's accurate uh, one action that can be taken at that meeting is called tabling again so I would encourage the council when they go to ordinance committee meeting to take as much time as you need in ordinance committee meeting and not take action per se like real action <laughs> at the council meeting until you really feel comfortable about it there's a lot of good ordinances out there for samples um, and I can get some samples to you as well um, one thing I want to point out about the 25 acres in a residential area it comes out to about a radius of 564 feet so that means a tower could be put in a rural area 565 feet from someone's house you have to think of it in terms of the radius of the whole whole thing. When you think of it in terms of that, you may even reconsider 25 acres. You might want to think 50 acres. But that brings me to really what the last speaker spoke to, and that is the community has said they don't want them in residential zones. And I think one counselor uh, was said the most promising thing, and that was that if we put uh, 200 or 300 foot towers in our industrial zones, we'll cover the whole town. That was really promising, and I think that's what the community wants. There's also other types of ideas, such as putting an overlay zone in northwest Scarborough, an overlay zone for a cell tower there if, if need be. But raising the heights in our current zones is really important. The community does not want them in residential zones. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Elisa Boxer, 16 Minute Man Drive, and thank you so much. Uh, one of the most promising things I heard tonight was that you are not going to go by the shot clock, which is basically the cell companies saying you have 90 days once we file an application, and if you don't do it, we'll sue you. So thank you. Um, they go around the country trying to do this, and some communities get scared, some don't. So hopefully we won't. Um, really, really appreciate that. Be and and Councillor St. Clair, thank you for representing us rather than representing the interests of industry. Um, yeah, I. I would absolutely encourage you to begin with increasing the height to 200 feet, starting with industrial zones. Um, we see in many, many communities towers packed, co-located uh, to the hilt. And so if it's a spacing issue, increasing the height to 200 feet would definitely solve any interference problems. Um, Again, we've seen it in other communities, and there are ordinances, and there are specifications to, to make that work. So I would encourage you to begin there. Um, yeah, I, I also <coughs> really appreciated Councillor Holbrook. There is a difference between data, someone's teenage son being able to play videos <coughs> in, in a brick house basement, as opposed to being able to call 911 on your cell if you're on the road. So I believe it was Dan Bacon who said um, the IDK consultant's map was for A-plus coverage. 
Um, I'd be very curious, especially in the RF district, who wants A plus coverage as opposed to just being able to call 911 from the road and not having the call um, be dropped. So, yeah, I guess the last thing is the expectation. And I know you've heard a lot about this, but I will echo it that when we buy our homes in an RF zone, um, not necessarily in a dense residential neighborhood, because I don't think any of us expect a tower to be plunked in the middle of a neighborhood, but if we're buying our homes in an RF zone, the expectation is that it's not going to become uh, the site for an industrial commercial facility like a cell tower. Um, and honestly, the same concerns do apply to the mini towers on telephone poles, and actually those can be more dangerous because they end up closer to homes. So I would encourage you to not go that route. Um, yeah, thank you. If you'd like to speak, please line up so we can don't take the time in between of Good evening. I'd also like to thank all of you for your hard work on this. Um, I'm Laura Hannon from 17 Powder Horn Drive, and I'd like to just reiterate my um, – I would not like these towers to be in residential areas um, or on utility poles in residential areas. And I'd also like to just say about RF areas, um, I'd encourage you to look ahead at this, the land use. I mean, maybe 20 or 30 years from now, these areas might be uh, neighborhoods. You know, we think of all the new neighborhoods that have sprung up in the last 20, 30 years. I mean, you might have a big parcel and you put a tower there, and, you know, a developer might come along and want to build a neighborhood there sometime, and there's a huge tower in the middle and really not suitable. Families are not going to want to move there, and you've lost a whole neighborhood of 30 or 40 homes, which would be bringing revenue in um, to Scarborough. So um, just because now, you know, you've got a big area doesn't mean that down the road that land is not going to be, you know, wanted for neighborhoods. Um, also, I'd like to say that maybe there are alternatives, like boosters, that someone could get for their home to boost their cell signal. Um, and also, you know, maybe I, I do support putting them in industrial areas and, and raising the height. Maybe you could find an industrial area by the water, put in a huge tower, make it look like a lighthouse, sell it as a, you know, <laughs> a tourist thing. But, um, anyway, but I, I definitely do not want them in RF areas or residential areas. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Julie Tupper, 165 Spurwink Road. Um, I'm going to echo what you've already heard uh, many people talk about. Um, I moved to Scarborough about three and a half years ago from South Portland, and the reason was I wanted to move out of a cluster neighborhood and get into more of a rural setting. So I bought my home on good faith that it was going to be a safe zone. And, you know, I've been hearing a little bit of conversation around this 25-acre um, scenario or more. And my concern is there's a farm across the street from me. He owns about 40 acres. So if all of a sudden he's allowed to have a cell tower on his land, the purchase of my house, which I did in good faith, is all of a sudden I got to move again. Because I happen to be one that's very, very sensitive to wireless. I don't have it in my house. I don't have a smart meter. I occasionally put on my cell phone to just check messages. But it's a choice. Um, I don't use wireless uh, uh, cordless phones because of the effects. I'm having effects in here because of the wireless. But I can control that. I can say no in my house. But if there's a tower across the street from me or within a, a, a mile, I can't control that, and it's going to affect me. I think you all remember S.D. Warren paper mill smell that would permeate towns and homes, and we couldn't control it, and we hated it. For those of you who cannot feel the effects of wireless, don't know what it's like, but I urge you to consider there are a lot of people who do have sensitivities, mostly children and small pets and small framed people. I have a nephew, 10 years old. He lives between two cell towers here in Scarborough. He's now a statistic for leukemia. Did the cell towers cause it? I don't know, but it falls in the pattern. 
So I'm really concerned, you know, that it's, it's, it's more than just the views. It's, it's more, more than even property values. There's a lot of health concerns, and I, for one, can feel the effects of it. So thank you very much for the work that you're doing, and I appreciate the dialogue that's gone on tonight. I think it's encouraging, and I hope it continues down that road. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, with that, I'll close the public hearing, public comments, and move on to minutes of last meeting. Second. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Abstain. Abstain. Okay, thank you. One abstain. <clears throat> Adjustments to the agenda? No. Um, no. No. Okay. Um, items be designed. Treasurer warrants. I've already done that. Uh, non action items. We have one. It's a report from the Canine Education and Enforcement Ad Hoc Committee. And we have Ms. Foley here tonight for I believe the so. present the presentation. Thank you. Uh, it's been a while since we've seen each other. Holbrook's got a new haircut. Everyone else got a little color from the sun for, from the summer, so everyone's looking healthy. Uh, I'm going to present to you the uh, findings of the Canine Education and Enforcement Committee. Uh, we are sunsetting, and, and this is our final uh, recommendation to the council. I believe the council's received this packet already for review, so this will be a summation. Should you have questions uh, more in depth on any of these, by all means, uh, let me know, and I'd be happy to discuss it. Um, Ms. Foley put together a lovely PowerPoint here to help uh, guide us through, so I'll go through this. Um, our charge was to work with the community services to enhance the educational programs and materials available, work with public works on the signage that's uh, currently on the beaches, Support the Plover Coordinator with beach monitoring programs. And I would like to say that we had a, a very uh, nice working relationship with Ryan and Bill. Uh, Ryan uh, putting a, a brand new program together and running that. I think he did an exemplary job for year one. And I look forward to advancements in that program for year two and, and beyond. Uh, evaluate the needs for dog parks and the potential of a tag program and then work with the pullover coordinator on designation of essential habitat areas. The educational program and materials and signage was one where we spent a considerable amount of time focusing on uh, in that it uh, really has the crux of the success of the program in its hands. Uh, adding codes of conduct and training scenarios for uh, the monitors uh, was a, a big step, I think, that needs to be taken for year two to provide adequate training uh, for the monitors on the beach uh, who are disseminating the codes and uh, information to beach goers. We also felt the um, quantity and placement of signs were adequate, um, if not overly abundant. Um, messaging on future signs, however, we thought could be more welcoming. Uh, we did find that uh, the messaging on the beaches through the signage presented kind of a, um, a very challenging atmosphere for folks who were just uh, coming to the beaches for the first time, uh, and it wasn't a very welcoming environment overall. So we'd like to see those messages um, recrafted to bring a little more of a welcoming environment. Uh, additionally, the messaging on off-season hours was uh, confusing to several people. They didn't understand the the terminology and the wording of the one to three uh, hours that were allowed for uh, folks to be on the beach without dogs. They thought that was the only time they could be on the beach with dogs. Uh, so there's a little confusion there, and I can see how that could happen. So we were uh, recommending that we uh, put up some sticker covers with some clarification as opposed to recreating all the signs. 
much like uh, they did on the turnpike when they switched to 65 to 70, they just put a, a sticker over the 65, and that could be adequately done uh, with a vinyl covering on the, on the signage that exists currently. Uh, and then lastly on signage, uh, the committee felt that the elimination of those removable real estate style signs that uh, propagated Higgins Beach from the, from the top of the shore down to the water line um, should be removed. Uh, as they presented an environment that w was more reminiscent of the Jersey Shore than of a uh, beach in Scarborough. So, uh, the dog parks uh, and tag programs, additionally, we spent a considerable amount of time reviewing. Uh, on the dog parks, uh, it was the, the committee's feeling that um, there's still no appetite for dog parks to be created. Uh, and it would uh, face stern opposition from the public in terms of spending any tax dollars to create a dog park or several dog parks that would be needed in Scarborough. Um, we did look at the options of privately funded dog parks, and in the, um, in the study of those, we found that those were the most effective uh, in terms of success rate uh, communities could have when they were privately funded, um, but still there would be significant uh, opposition for doing so, and it would be a very costly experience nonetheless. Dog parks, a uh, single dog park will run somewhere between fifty and $75,000 per year to generate and maintain. Um, the TAG program, uh, we looked far and wide for the TAG program examples that we could build a recommendation around. The only one we were able to uh, identify with any sort of uh, long-term uh, use was a TAG program in Boulder, Colorado, and they instituted it in 2006. Um, at great expense, and uh, they, they tried very uh, desperately to get that off the ground and running, they ran it for four years, and what they found was while initially they had some success with it, and Boulder is a, a much smaller uh, community where that would be a little bit more successful than Scarborough where it's more spread out and you have a a lot of different areas to cover. Um, even that, they found that after the fourth year, there was no reduction in the, um, in the incidents um, with dogs that the uh, TAG program was curtailing. Uh, and so they found it to be a, a wholly ineffective program, uh, and they spent a considerable amount of money uh, to generate that program. Consequently, though the uh, council was uh, charging us to come up with some kind of a program that would emulate that, uh, we would recommend instead that um, no TAG program uh, be instituted. Uh, it's it's uh, the belief of the council and the committee, rather, that um, the resources to generate a TAG program and maintain and create a TAG program could be better used on educational uh, materials uh, and that um, Scarborough would see no appreciable gain from instituting a TAG program that the cons of doing so would far outweigh the pros. There would be considerable uh, reluctance again from the community to have such a thing. And it also, you know, the, the target being uh, visitors to our town, it's a very difficult program to disseminate to folks coming into the town to have any uh, form of efficacy that would be measurable. Uh, and so the uh, the recommendation of the committee is that um, we don't go down the same path that another community uh, spent great time, money, and effort to try to institute with no success. Mm -hmm. And instead, we learn from that experience, and we go in a different direction and apply uh, our resources in a, in a more uh, effective manner. Essential habitat areas. Um, you know, obviously, this season for plovers was uh, arguably the most successful we've had in a decade. It was a wonderfully um, uh, successful season. I, I await the Audubon report uh, to review those results. But overall, um, there are uh, the town. We, be, we believe now the town may apply to the state for the delisting of Ferry Beach as an essential habitat. Uh, no nesting birds have been seen there, uh, and this would allow uh, the state to not have any further impediments on things like dredging. Um, and so that 
we would uh, request that the town manager uh, take out the necessary paperwork to begin that process for the delisting of that as essential habitat. However, what we also found and discussed as a, a committee was that the areas to the north and south of Scarborough Beach should be added to essential habitat because there were plovers that nested there. Uh, and so what we really spent a lot of time looking at was where were the plovers, where was the successful uh, uh, breeding grounds for the plovers, and were our designated areas in the same, in the same place. And so uh, our, as you see in the, in the, um, in the report, we're, we were off by a little bit. Uh, on, on essential habitats and where we assumed they would be versus where they showed up and thrived. In fact, uh, many of the plovers that thrived were well outside of the protected areas and into the general population areas, and they did just fine. Uh, and the protected areas that were cordoned off saw no activity at all, and so we were protecting uh, the sand dunes, essentially. Uh, the plovers um, had found other ways and, and means to uh, propagate. So. Uh, other recommendations, uh, continue the monitor program. It was a great program. Again, I, I commend Ryan and Bill uh, for, for running a very difficult and challenging year one uh, with all the obstacles in their way. I thought they did a, an exemplary job. Um, start getting those commitments and conducting those trainings much earlier, however. We, wanna, we would love to see uh, a full slate of monitors who are educated and ready to go when that season starts. Uh, obviously, it was a late start this year for, for many reasons, but we have the opportunity now uh, to start much earlier. So by the end of March, we would love to see all of those monitors in place, trained, and, and uh, ready to hit the beaches. Uh, additionally, we'd, we'd uh, recommend eliminating the restricted areas for year two. State land restrictions are more than adequate at Higgins Beach and Ferry Beach, and they're by and large irrelevant as per the plover success at Pine Point Beach this year. Again, uh, the plovers that were very successful at Pine Point were well outside of the protected areas, um, and so their success rate wasn't, uh, wasn't due to their protected area, but more that's where they chose to the nest, and they did just fine. Uh, we also found that the the different regulations from beach to beach were very confusing for people. And so Higgins Beach having a different uh, regulation on what could occur in the restricted area versus uh, Pine Point Beach, which uh, has a, a slightly different twist on that, um, should consolidate that, remove the additional restrictions as they're not necessary. And that is the conclusion of our report in summary, and you have the full report in detail uh, at your disposal. Uh, we request that you act on that. Any questions? Can I just say something? Yeah. Yep. Can we to go now? Did you want to ask a question? No, I wanted to say something. Um, okay, seeing that, I'd like to thank you and thank everyone on the committee for serving and uh, going through um, all those me nights of meetings on uh, the um, issues that were um, given to you in the resolution um, by the council. So thank you very much. Um, there's no questions. So with that, um, Council Sinclair. Thanks. Just I was the council liaison to this committee, so that's why I wanted to say something mm -hmm. br briefly. Um, I was very impressed with this group of people that, again, I mean, it's always – it's always a task. They were given a big task. They handled it well. Um, when you volunteer your services, I mean, I'm on the appointments committee, so we know how challenging it can be to get people to volunteer their services. And these guys came in week after week after week, ready to go, on task. Um, because I was a council member and they were on the committee and the back history, we didn't always necessarily see eye to eye on everything. But we were able to get through that, and that was what made the process to me in my in my world such an amazing thing. It was handled on um, a com communication level where we could talk through it, and I, lo I loved that about it. Um, I learned a lot. I know, <laughs> I know a lot about birds, way more than I ever thought possible. Um, and I think it's I think it gave me goosebumps when I and I I'm sure that's probably some people are probably rolling their eyes, but um when I saw that this was the most this was the best year yet and I thought that was a great thing and 
you know, we all have been through a lot with this, um, staff, council, um, townspeople, and this was our best year. And that, to me, is, I don't know, that something we should be proud of. And, okay, so some people look at it like, yep, it's a couple birds, but, yep, it's a couple people that didn't get to walk their dog, but it's not, it's bigger than that. And there was a lot of things that got accomplished during these meetings, and I'm proud of that, and I'm proud of you as a group. Um, and I'm proud of this council for supporting this going forward. And um, so I wanted to thank the council also and Chairman Sullivan for helping us um, be able to put together this packet and, and have the time to present it. So thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Council Sinclair. Um, the, uh, as far as the uh, recommendations and implementation of those, that will probably take place sometime this winter. Um, under a new council. So um, with that being said, we'll move on to... Order number 14-72 uh, is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed designation of Griffin Road Affordable, affordable Housing Development District and adopting the development program for such district and author, authoring a credit enhancement agreement for such district pursuant to the attached order 14-72 and the provisions of Chapter 207 of Title 38 of the Maine Revised Statutes as amended and authorize the town manager to sign any and all documents pursuant to said district. Okay. With that, um, I open the public hearing uh, for the Griffin Road Affordable Housing Development District. Uh, um, would anyone like to speak to that? Okay. <laughs> well, Not everybody at the same time. <laughs> well, seeing none, I close the public hearing. Um, do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Okay, discussion. Yay. <laughs> Can I say that? Want, I mean, we've been over, and over this. Asking for. Sure. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry to interject. That went so fast. <laughs> um, again, my name is Shauna Mueller, for the record. Uh, I'm an attorney at Bernstein Sure, representing the town on TIF matters. I just wanted to let the council know we have um, negotiated a credit enhancement agreement that goes along with this TIF. That's the agreement between the town and the developer here that um, dictates the way in which property taxes on the increased assessed value resulting from the project will be divided. And um, so I just wanted to describe that and that in the order, um, the long version of the order that's in your packet, it provides uh, delegated authority to the town manager to um, not only execute that credit enhancement agreement, which follows the, um, the application document that's in your materials, um, but it also provides the town manager the authority to make some changes that are non-substantive to that document as the town, if it's approved tonight, will um, send it on to Maine Housing for final approval. Um, so I just wanted to say we know we're going to make a couple of different changes in there that are very minor, but one of them I thought was worth noting. Um, this, this agreement between the town and the developer is um, an agreement whereby the developer will have the right to receive 50% reimbursement on its future property taxes paid for a term of 15 years total. The TIF district term is 17 years, but we have um, drafted the language in such a way that that 15-year term will not begin until the project receives its certificate of occupancy. From that point forward, it will be 15 years. That's the um, threshold that the developer is interested in getting because it provides them additional points towards um, the federal tax credits that main housing issue. So I just wanted to lay that out. That will be clarified somewhat from the document you've received in a couple of places, and I'm happy to tell you exactly where, but I just wanted to describe those are um, the types of changes that we will make um, in tweaks before it goes to main housing if you approve this today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I apologize. I didn't realize that you wanted to speak. Um, with that, um, is there any questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, oh. Council Blaze. I've got one question. Um, 
what is the difference of income to the town if we go ahead with this or if we disapprove this? Um, that's a good question. It's a little bit like um, reading a crystal ball. But um, the projection if this project goes forward is that it will produce roughly, I think it's um, depending on what mill rate escalator you use, uh, roughly $25,000 in property taxes per year. Um, the proposal here is to divide that 50-50 between the housing initiative fund, the affordable housing initiative fund of the town, and the developer reimbursement. Um, you ask if you don't approve it, what would happen? Um, I think the developer is likely to say, and I and I can they can certainly speak for themselves that this project isn't likely to move forward without this approval. Um, so in that sense, it's unclear what will happen to the property um, and whether or not there will be increased tax revenue, uh, but there's certainly the possibility something else may get developed there. Um, so that's sort of the crystal ball aspect of your question. Wasn't, wasn't this property originally uh, moved from a residential zone to a, what, a TVC or whatever you call that zone yeah, th about this 18 months ago? That, I, I suspect we should have the developer get up and speak to those specifics about the project itself. Uh, would you like to come on up? So just while Kevin takes the, the stage, um, the zone was changed uh, in advance of any proposal from this developer. It was done as part of the uh, planning process through the Long Range Planning Committee and one of the many cleanup improvements uh, for the comp plan. So it was done in advance, not in response to this particular request. I realize that. But yeah. when it came forward to us originally, it was for apartments. Right. Yeah. Right. Correct. Mm -hmm. It's changed uh, over time. This is Kevin. Yes. Um, well, I think it's going to try to respond to, yeah, okay. to Ed's question. Okay. But so a couple yes. of things about the maybe a little bit about the timeline and how it's changed over time, and then the specifics of the of the, the dollars. Um, the the first iteration that came before you, which I believe you referred to, was uh, had three buildings, maybe three or four buildings, more units. It was family housing. There were a couple affordable units to get a little additional density, uh, but it wasn't an affordable housing project. Um, then that, that I wasn't involved in that. I subsequently bought into the partnership with the Bears Rockies here tonight. and can talk about the early history. Um, but the idea that the Bears and I had jointly was that we would create a senior affordable housing project, which is something that I specialize in. Mm -hmm. Kevin Bunker, Developers Collaborative. And we turned into one building, reduced the parking, Reduce the unit count and tuck the building back against the uh, against the site. Um, so there was a lot of um, abutter issues that went away just by virtue of those changes. The remaining abutter issues that we had, we worked out on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I think I can confidently say that we that we changed a situation that had a fair bit of controversy when we started to one that really people were were quite comfortable with. Um, then moving on to the actual dollars, the the, the taxes right now are about $3,000. So the, the TIF is really only about the increment. So the, so the total taxes would be about 28 upon completion, 3 plus 25. So we would be proposing that 12.5 of that increment be returned to the project and 12.5 go to the town. So the town would actually be getting about 15.5, 12.5 of which the town has elected to put in that affordable housing fund. And I am here to tell you, I've explained a few times before I can go through the scoring, but Without these three points, this project isn't, isn't going to score high enough, not this year. Um, there's a proposal to do a big bond issue for senior high. It might be a couple years down the road. That might change things and really allow some development, allow them to get down the list. But uh, the scoring is pretty competitive. I've seen the, the list of pre-applications for this year. And there's two, there's two that I think have a real good shot, and there's five or six that are kind of, I think, on the cut line. They might do one or two of those, and ours is one of those. So even, and that's with this TIF. So um, we, we built in 17 years because we need 15 years to get those points. And we, we asked for 17 years so we have an opportunity to try yet again next year if we're not successful. We need to do every single thing we can to score high enough to do it. And I'm, I'm very comfortable saying that um, we don't have enough points without this, this TIF. 
the TIF doesn't doesn't increase our cash flow one bit. It allows Maine Housing to give us uh, less of their scarce resource and load us up with more debt. So it helps their money go farther, helps their mission, helps them do more housing. Um, and for that, they give us points because it shows that the town is willing to partner with us on the development and they want to incentivize those kinds of projects. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else? Uh, Council Holbrook, I think you were next. Were you? Oh, um, sure. So I, I guess I just want to say, um, you know, I wholeheartedly support this project. I, I think, um, and, and I think he said it best is, you know, it, it ha meets so many needs on, on so many levels. Senior housing, affordable senior housing is a scarce resource, not even for Scarborough, but really just, you know, southern Maine in, in general. So the one bedroom living that you can afford on a maybe a social security income is, is very much needed in, in, in the community. Um, also, as we spoke to a little bit, um, the concerns from the neighborhood, you know, the potential of what can be built in, in this location. Um, certainly, yes, there's maybe more tax dollars that could come into, into the town's pocket by building it at its full potential. However, there's that little, you know, hidden cost of things. I think our per pupil cost is somewhere in the city of 10 grand a pop. So um, if you build at full potential and maybe squeak out another 10 grand in tax revenue to spend it in your schools teaching kids, it washes. So th there is a cost benefit there. Um, so it meets a very much high need. There's probably a cost savings to the town and um, it helps us possibly move some other affordable initiatives further in the future. So um, I do wish you great luck in scoring high on your <laughs> high on your points. Councilor Katarina. Yeah, just by chance uh, today, and I was reading in National Association of Realtors demographic study that just came out that said probably one of the least served populations in the next 10 to 30 years is going to be the elderly, uh, and particularly those on fixed incomes. So this is going to be ahead of the curve. Uh, again, I support it wholeheartedly. There are a number of people in my demographic uh, who are going to need places to move to and they can't afford their single family homes anymore. Uh, and I think this type of a project is, is uh, necessary and I'm very happy to support it myself. So. Council Donovan. This is the kind of project that towns can really step up and make a contribution to the community because uh, uh, we're talking about people who are uh, uh, really unable to find good housing in this community at this price. Mm -hmm. This is totally uh, unique and uh, given the difficulty that we've seen with tax rates and tax increases, this is a perfect example of allowing some senior citizens with low incomes to land on their feet, and I totally support it. Okay. All right, now I'll say my two cents. <coughs> um, the, uh, you know, since this conversation has started, um, I've actually ran into three senior couples that have been waiting for something like this. They don't want to leave Scarborough. Mm -hmm. They want to stay here in Scarborough. They love it. They've been here all their lives and uh, they've just been holding on for that reason. And uh, I think, um, you know, like I said, once we started this conversation, they approached me and said that was a wonderful idea and um, that it's a, you know, good use of um, the property um, from what I'm hearing from the neighbors um, and that had a huge issue with it um, before they seem to be settled down a little bit with the um, project that's at hand now. So I think it's a win-win for the community in in the whole. So with that, um, I don't have anything else. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Thank you. Order number 1478 is the 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license from Exit 42 Donuts, LLC. Doing business is Dunkin' Donuts, located at 284 Payne Road. 
Okay, yeah, I'll open the public hearing. Would anyone like to speak to the license issues? Anyone? Seeing none, close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Discussion? Welcome to Scarborough. Councilor Benedict. It seems to me uh, that this Dunkin' Donuts is already open. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. They provided a, it, it was, um, as long as they have it on file with us and they have their occupancy permit, they know they still have to go through this pro process, so they have a conditional license. It, it, what was the last thing you said? A conditional license. Conditional. Excuse me. Conditional yeah. license. <coughs> Anyone else? Mm -mm. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Order number 1479 is the 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a combined massage establishment and massage therapist license from Leslie Gersham doing business as Leslie Gersham Massage Therapy located at 11 Farmhouse Road. Okay, would anybody from the public like to speak to this order? Seeing none, I close the public hearing. Motion. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, discussion. No one wants to discuss it. Welcome. Well, if she wants to come in here and like make her way down the line, you know. Yeah. All those in favor? Opposed? None. Uh, no old business. Moving on to new business is order number 14-80. Act on the request to place the referendum question to purchase a new fire truck on the local ballot for the November 4th, 2014 municipal election. Would anyone here in the audience like to speak to order 1480? Request for a fire truck. Just to note, uh, we had a gentleman earlier, first one, that spoke to um, this order um, being denied by the council. Uh, with that? Move approval. Second. Okay, discussion. Councilor Holbrook. <laughs> we went up in the jam. He was looking my way. Um, <laughs> I just want to go out on, on a limb on this, and I know I do not know for a hundred percent certain for this particular truck that we are looking to retire the state of perhaps disrepair it's in or the state of quasi acceptability that it's in. However, I've been here a little while. <laughs> And I have had opportunity in the past to see some of our vehicles as, you know, through, through walkthroughs and that sort and certain things. Um, and I do know of the last fire truck that we purchased and how much it just was past any useful life whatsoever. It would not be put on the road at that point. There was nothing left to the frame. There was nothing left to the body. I mean, you could put your fist mm -hmm. through holes in, in some of that framework of the of that vehicle. Um, it is main. We do use salt. It's corrosive. I, Generally speaking, um, like I said, I, I can't speak to this specific vehicle. I think it maybe would behoove me to go check it out. But um, in, in every other circumstance that I've, ha I've dealt with this in the past, it was very much merited and needed, and, and it wasn't a question of if it was past its use anymore. Um, I do have, I guess, faith that, that it's an accurate description that it is probably time to be replaced. Okay, thank you. Anyone down here? Council St. Clair. I would just have to agree with <coughs> Councilor Holbrook. Um, I haven't been on council as long as she has, but um, I do know that every time the fire department or the police department have come to us and asked us to do something like this. Um, it's been extremely needed um, and probably has needed, has been a need for a while. Um, and I have the utmost faith in them that if they're asking us to put this on the ballot, there's a very good reason for it. And on the flip side of that, I'm always in favor of putting something on the ballot, put it out to a vote, and let the townspeople decide for it. That's our, you know, that's, that's my, our job, so that's it. Okay, well, um 
speaking from experience, um, the gentleman earlier tonight spoke of his experience with aircraft. I uh, have experience with aircraft. They're not exposed to the corrosive um, corrosion um, on airfields like uh, fire, you know, a I believe that would be an aluminum or stainless steel um, body has been exposed to the highly corrosive salt and um, other additives that we use um, So on the roads. Um, I mean, people just with regular cars can see the deterioration of their vehicles much faster nowadays with the, uh, you know, the, I think what we call it a bare road policy. So, um, Talking from my experience, I have driven 25-year-old fire trucks, and they're really not safe. Mm -hmm. um, stuff can go anytime you're rushing to an emergency. This is an emergency vehicle um, that have lives on board that are going to extreme emergency calls, fires, uh, heart attacks. Um, those trucks um, really do have a, a useful life, and 25 years is... I mean, I've, I've actually run 30-year trucks, and they're even worse. Um, back when the city of Portland really was tight with money. So I, I know what it's like to run those uh, old trucks, and it's not, it's not safe. So um, that's my two cents to my fellow counselors. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, um, is there anyone? Any, no one else? All those in favor? Opposed? None. Order number 1481 is act on the request to place the referendum question to fund a townwide revaluation re on the local ballot for November 4th, 2014 municipal elections. And I believe the town manager. Yes, uh, if I could, uh, I'd like to pass out just a revised um, copy. Uh, thankfully, actually, a, a resident, uh, Mr. Hanley, pointed out that we had a number uh, incorrect on this form. And he was, in fact, correct, so we've corrected that. Uh, and just to draw your attention to it, uh, the financial statement that is a requirement to go with any bond order uh, must list, among other things, the total outstanding uh, indebtedness and bonds, and the number on the previous order was, was incorrect, so it's been corrected in the version I just passed you. Okay. All right. Would anyone from the public like to speak to Order 1481, Municipal Ballot, Bond? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? Move. So moved. Second. Discussion? I should have mentioned, just for clarification, this would fund the actual uh, reval to hire an outside company to come in and reval the uh, all property in town and also provides for updated software to manage that, that new information, new data that's, uh, that's derived from that process. Good. No one? Uh, I'd just like to, I'd just like to say, uh, I, I believe we're due for a revaluation, right, Tom? Uh, the last one was in 2005, so we're approaching the 10-year mark. Yes. Okay. So I think it's necessary that we do this. And I think Tom and uh, the uh, tax Bill? assessor kind of agreed that it would, this he being new, it would be kind of good to have it come in have an independent group come in and do it? Well, certainly given the amount of questions that have been raised by taxpayers, I think mm -hmm. uh, the intent of this, I would hope, would help clarify some of that, uh, those questions. Uh, as I said at the time this was discussed at budget time, I personally and professionally don't expect wide changes in value, um, but we'll see. Uh, but if there's a question and, and perception breeds reality, so this will certainly, I, I hope, um, um, address some of those concerns in terms of assessment practices and ultimate values that are produced as a part of that. Thank you. Councilor Benedict. The only question I have is, would any part of this reevaluation be able to be used by the townspeople or the town in the ongoing court case? This up that's going on right now. Well, it can't be after the fact. That's why I asked the question. Yeah, it, 
exactly as uh, Councillor Blaise said, I'm not an attorney, but I, I believe um, the timing would be such that evidence would be complete before the judge. In fact, it is complete now. Uh, and there's an extended delay. Uh, we're looking at these new values being effective uh, for 2016, I believe. That's my expectation. So it's, it's still a ways out to have the final product. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah, Thank okay. you. Councilor, I don't know which one was first, but Councilor Katarina, ladies first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, Tom, do we know who the vendor is? No, we go, th or does it go, out to we go through an RFP process for okay. pricing purposes. We have talked to a couple of them. Okay. Uh, there is a preferred one, frankly, and that preference is for two reasons. One, their, their, uh, their ability to perform these sorts of mass uh, revaluations, and also their software product is a superior, superior product. And, and I would just weigh in, too, um, that I think it's time for revaluation, given all the market changes that have gone on since 2005. It makes sense that, and given the the time, we're 10 years out, so I I would support this. Council Donovan, could we ask the uh, town manager to go over the timeline during which this would take place mm -hmm. and when it would take effect for the purposes of uh, tax bills that citizens would be receiving? As I mentioned, we'd go through a selective an RFP process, so we'd select a vendor. Um, I presume that would happen over the late fall or early winter months. Uh, ideally, we'd select a vendor sometime uh, early in the spring. And because values uh, take effect as of April or every year, and there's an extended process involved, uh, this will involve actually physically going inside um, every property in town, which is one of the benefits, obviously, to make sure that the data and records are accurate. That in and of itself takes three or four months is my expectation. There's, there's an extended uh, period for meeting with taxpayers and them appealing those new values. So that's a long way of saying my expectation is the new values would take effect uh, April 1st, 2016. I think that uh, since it's uh, a 2016 event, that really makes it 11 years out. Mm -hmm. And given that we've had a substantial recession between 2005 and 2016, uh, the town really would benefit tremendously from knowing that the values are now reestablished at whatever they are. Uh, and a lot of the doubts that people might have about the appropriateness of their uh, tax assessments would be answered by doing this. So I think this is a wise uh, expenditure. Mm -hmm. Council Holbrook. <laughs> I didn't even raise my hand. Um, just. I, I guess I would just point out um, cart before the horse. It goes through voter referendum. Right. So I don't know that people will be too happy to really want to have a reevaluation. I, I imagine there's probably those that are quite happy and mm -hmm. hopping up and down to have an, an independent review. And I imagine there's probably a whole other set of people that are going, don't look at my house that yeah, close. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I will so gladly support it. <laughs> so oh. may go up, so may go down. Yeah, exactly. Some people may go down. Hey, anyone down the center? I, I agree. I think it needs to be done at the time. Okay. End of discussion. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? All right. Standing committee reports, liaison reports. So we'll start with Council of St. Clair. Um, I'm quick. My, my two large com committees that I've been working on um, both presented tonight, uh, so I'm hoping that opens me up a little bit to spend a little time with some of my other committees that I've been lacking in a little bit, and I appreciate um, some of my fellow council members standing in for me at times over the last few months. Um, so I think I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Council Blaze. Uh, no committee meetings. Okay. Council Benedict. Nothing to report. Nice. See how nice and clean we are down here? <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> I'll mess it up. I know. <laughs> Councilor Katarina. You'll yield uh, your time to Jim. To yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yield, yield your time. Um, the long term planning committee, um, you've probably read in the paper uh, that we've been working on 
looking at Dunstan and how we can revitalize mm -hmm. that area. It's, it's a long um, process. Uh, there will be a meeting uh, for people uh, out in the public to know about Monday, September 8th from 6.30 to 8 uh, here at Town Hall, uh, basically a brainstorming session um, to follow up on the Sustained Southern Maine's pilot study on Dunstan. Uh, there will be a workshop at 4.30 that will be the neighbors, property owners, and business owners in Dunstan, and you're welcome to come and, and listen there, but we really want that to be a time when the neighbors and the people who will be impacted potentially down the road uh, with anything will speak. But at 6.30, uh, other people are invited, and I believe that all of the counselors got an invitation today, I think. It came out on email, but it came out anyway, yeah. So that's really the big thing long-term planning is working on, and that's it. Okay, thank you. Councilor Donovan. Uh, neither energy nor finance met uh, during the summer season uh, since we last uh, had a uh, town council meeting, so I have nothing to report. Okay, thank you. Councilor Holbrook. Uh, yeah. So we, thinking of finance, and I just had it in front of me and <laughs> lost it, there we go. Um, finance committee will be meeting September 16th, um, and that will be at 9 o'clock, their usual time, and a.m., not p.m. Mm. <laughs> uh, and to continue um, going over your today as well as um, if Tom has any, maybe, I know you've been busy, but <laughs> if he's had any more progress on our um, list of what are some, you know, he's been trying to pull together all the information on what shared services are with the school and the town mm -hmm. and um, trying to put, a, 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 which is hard, a dollar number on what that might be and what some things we have that it might be opportunities that are available as well. Um, so we also will have... Um, school department um, mm -hmm. there as well at that meeting and they'll be going over some of just their year-end totals with us and that's it for finance. I have Housing Alliance will be meeting this Thursday, September 4th at 6.30. Um, I'm, among other things, I'm sure they'll be talking about Griffin Road and our vote tonight. Uh, they also will be talking about um, our other, the other project, which is the Habitat mm -hmm. Community Project on Broad Turn, um, that does go in front of the planning board. I think that's their their next meeting, which I don't have on me. It's September fifteenth. Um, September fifteenth. So um, that project is kind of moving along, and, and at that meeting at, with the Housing Alliance, um, we'll be getting an update on on the progress of that, um, as well as looking at some possible potential other sites and other projects that might be available um, or opportunities and just looking to see what else we might be able to put our fingers in and get involved with. Um, our other committee is uh, Historic Preservation. They met um, just this last evening. Um, we do have a regular scheduled meeting for the first Tuesday of next month, although um, that is possibly being postponed for now, more to come. We're hopeful to have an outreach meeting. Um, we are at a place of that committee that there is a mostly complete list of, at this point, that they're comfortable with, um, of what is left with histor historic significance in town. Um, comfortable enough that we'd like to go to that next step of an outreach meeting. So there should be um, the mailers Head, kind of heading out to the people that own those properties. Some of those might be buildings, some might be structures, some might be a monument that's there or something that's unmarked that's there. Um, but it's a vested parties meeting. We're hoping to have an outreach meeting to achieve a couple of things. Um, the, the first objective is more or less just to let folks know that, hey, you have something unique and do you know that? <laughs> so that's the first step. Um, the second step is um, just to solicit some feedback from, from the homeowners and, and the property owners as to um, ideas and concepts that they might have as far as um, what can we do to help them as a town to encourage that preservation and, and not hinder it. Um, so again, um, like I said, we don't have a firm date for that, but that, that should be coming, and like I said, everybody should be receiving a mailing. 
Um, and then Historic Preservation also has the, um, I'm happy to say, the majority of the work at the Hanawa House is now done. Um, the last step, it will be the air vents on the building so that the mm -hmm. building does breathe, um, but all other work is complete at this point. Um, and the committee is looking at exploring opportunities um, to actually get the house maybe open for a weekend or two during the summer and maybe partner with the historical society and have you know an exhibit and, and that sort of thing. So again, they're exploring those avenues. And um, also at the last meeting, they started working on a criteria for a short core list of properties that the town might want to pursue. Um, so that was a very lengthy, all-consuming discussion for, for that meeting of you know, what level and what criteria makes it a, a, a truly unique Scarborough heart and soul, what's the criteria um, that we might have an interest in owning or securing that for the future. Um, and that's it for me. Okay, thank um, you. Richard, um, can, I, um, can I just say one yes, question? I'm so sorry to yep. interrupt. Um, yep. I just wanted to let the public know that our next ordinance meeting is scheduled for September 17th. It is at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I know that there has been, I've gotten a couple emails from people struggling with that time being in the middle of the day for people that work. Um, and so I want people to know that we have, I have taken that to heart. Um, this last, this meeting in September was already um, put into our calendars, I think, three or four months ago. Um, so I'm hoping to, to maybe start even alternating those to try to accommodate those people that can't come during the day. Um, and that it's, it's helpful to staff to do it during the day because they're here a lot. And so um, it's also helpful to um, single moms. So um, that's mainly why we have done it that way. Um, but I'm very happy to um, try to alternate that so that we can try to accommodate some other people. So I just wanted to make sure people knew that we did, we, I did get those emails and we are taking that to heart and we're going to try to make some changes um, starting, well, October and then November, yeah. So starting possibly with a new council. Okay, thank you. Um, I have uh, no committee reports, and that leads us into the town manager's report. Okay. A couple of quick points of interest. Um, as was mentioned, the Habitat Project is coming back to the planning board. Um, the Alliance, did, I think, did a great job of insisting that they give us a, a, a fairly firm schedule, and they're on schedule. So uh, uh, we're pleased to see that moving forward. As a part of that project, um, the council may recall the town received a CDBG grant to extend the sewer to enable this project. Uh, the town is administering that bid, uh, and those bids are due September 16th, and so uh, we'll be under construction this fall, assuming that the bids come in uh, at an acceptable level. Uh, there's also a public meeting coming up. Uh, this is on the Pine Point Crossing Bridge. The uh, DOT is replacing the bridge on the lower end of Pine Point Road. Uh, again, that is on September 16th here in these chambers at 6 p.m., and DOT will be updating the public and other interested parties as to the plan uh, and the time frame and, and the like. Uh, Jean Marie mentioned the Dunstan uh, Revitalization Plan brainstorming session. If you can, I encourage you to come. The invitations have gone to the Town Council, to SEDCO, Long Ridge Planning, Housing Alliance, and, ha and Historic Preservation. So there ought to be a very interesting mix of folks that have been invited. And if uh, members of the Council can go, that would be terrific. Um, I'll coordinate with Chairman Sullivan, but uh, there's an offer has been extended from the school department to do a special tour for the council of the new Wentworth School. Should that be of interest? Mm -hmm. uh, students are, are in the facility, and so it's taken full shape. So I'll work with Councilor Sullivan as to whether that's of interest, and, and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll find a date that works. Mm -hmm. And lastly, just to mention for housekeeping for council and for the public, uh, Chairman Sullivan has, has agreed to allow workshops before the next uh, two council meetings. That's the one on September 17th. And on that evening at 6 p.m., like we did this evening, uh, there will be two different contract zone uh, matters to be discussed. One is an amendment to an existing one, and one is a brand new one. And then on October 1st, the indoor ice arena uh, will be the subject of a workshop before that mm -hmm. regular meeting. And perhaps going forward, should it go well, this might be some uh, model that we could look at going forward 
so the council has a consistent opportunity to talk about things as opposed to having them land on your agenda and be uh -huh. um, you know, with some urgency of action. Uh, so that's a model that uh, this will be a good experience just to see if it works well. Well, just to uh, piggyback on that, um, I think it has been a good experience. I don't. I think uh, most of the council thinks so. Uh, that um, having these workshops, I mean, we've had quite a few this year. Yes. In total, so and they've worked out well. Um, we've got yes. uh, yeah. all our issues aired out amongst uh, councilors, and uh, I think it's. Uh, I think it's. We've avoided a lot of. Um, uh, doing a lot of uh, back and forth with uh, amendments. And it may be easier to get into a routine such as the first meeting of every month. There's a workshop at 6, and, the, and obviously the subject matter will change, and perhaps there's not a need to, but I, I think there's enough on your agenda that there's always something to talk about. Right. I think that works out better. Everybody gets to say their piece and yeah. Um, yeah. and better chance to, you know, um, convince counselors to see things your way. Yeah. And it's terrific <laughs> for staff because that gives us direction so we can prepare things for your next meeting that are far, far more in, in liking with your expectation. And also the public gets to hear what every, each counselor is thinking so on the matter. So that, that's all I have tonight. Yep. Okay, with that we'll go to um, council member comments and is Council Holbrook ready? I am just Nothing. Good evening. Zero. All right. Wow. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Donovan. Uh, uh, I did. We had the K9 report. That was uh, uh, helpful to to get that in. It's the end of the season. It's an opportunity to look back at uh, what really happened uh, this past year. And and uh, as I think it's been said by from many quarters that the Plumber Protection Program was uh, a big success. And one of the things that I want to applaud out of it was the volunteer monitors. People may not realize that uh, the monitoring program on the beach uh, was done all by volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've always believed that it was not a police presence. People have often said, well, if we only enforce the rules, well, uh, I've always thought that uh, a police presence was not the way to do it. Uh, a gentler, kinder, more uh, educational approach, which is what the Beach Monitor program offers, uh, and these people offered their time all summer from May 7th when we passed this ordinance through until the last several days. So it's been, uh, it's been a wonderful contribution to the public. I want people to recognize that. And uh, when, when people say, well, it's been a very successful program, uh, the state of Maine, <clears throat> IFW, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Maine Audubon, which really run these plubber monitoring uh, and protection programs, they measure success uh, by do you have good ordinances and programs in place? And we do. We put them in place this year. Uh, uh, they measure them uh, on data. Uh, did you have uh, uh, any number of plovers actually arrive on your beach, nest, and the chicks made it off the beach uh, in any numbers? And we had numbers that exceeded uh, anything we've had in recent years. Uh, uh, Pine Point did remarkably well. Uh, Higgins has finally come back. And they measure it in what they call productivity. What percentage of the chicks that are born actually survive? and make it off the beach. Uh, and uh, Higgins Beach had the highest productivity in the state, uh, uh, which I attribute uh, to the protection that was afforded uh, uh, the, uh, the chicks and the parents uh, uh, through the program we put in place. Uh, I think it was a great summer from the point of view that people who uh, cherish their, uh, uh, their opportunities on the beach to have their dogs out there running, that still existed. There's a tremendous uh, uh, collegiality amongst dog owners that I think is a great social element of, of, of Higgins. I see it more at Higgins because I live there, uh, and, I, and I really applaud that. I think that's, that's really terrific. Uh, uh, I think there was also a, a winner here 
in all the winners that we had uh, were the people who uh, are not as comfortable having dogs off leash on the beach. And these programs provided people with the opportunity to uh, have places on the beach where they were not going to be subject to any kind of disruption. And getting back to the monitors, the, uh, I living at Higgins Beach, I, I have seen for years how there was no enforcement of dogs on leash in the evening hours. It simply was an unenforced and ignored rule. And this year, I've had so many people come up and tell me what a great year it was. We could go to the beach in the evenings and know that we were going to be able to enjoy the beach. And it was, and it was because the monitors were there uh, with courtesy uh, and, and uh, a friendly face to make sure that the rules were enforced. And I want to applaud them for that effort. It was wonderful. Thank you. Councilor Caterina. Um, yeah, just a couple of things. Uh, um, first, uh, to do with cell phone coverage, I know um, there are those who say, well, I'll, I live in the RF zone. Uh, I would like to have A-plus coverage myself, but, you know, I know I'm not going to get A-plus maybe, but I, I would like to see increased coverage from a public safety point of view uh, and also from a business point. Uh, point of view, uh, and just remind people that it's not just about voice, it's also about data. And there are a number of people like myself who, when we're out and about working with clients and whomever, we work on tablets and whatever, so um, I, I, I'm hopeful we can work something out, I know we will, uh, that will give us much better coverage in the part of Scarborough where I live, which is North Scarborough. Um, also, I wanted to thank the monitors uh, working at the beaches. I didn't make it, well, I guess I did make it down to Pine Point once or twice, but I'm at Higgins frequently because I have relatives who live at Higgins Beach, and I, I saw a real difference this year also um, with, you know, when dogs were on leash, off leash. I think most people followed that, and I didn't see any particular issues or hear about it. Um, so, and I know that was a yeoman's job on the part of the monitors to do that. I also want to thank the folks who did volunteer to be on the canine committee. Because I know, I, I believe they met weekly and, you know, they put together um, a pretty involved report that, as Richard said, we will look at. Uh, we've got a lot on our plate right now, but um, as we get nearer the winter, we'll probably be looking at that. Uh, and then my last thing is just so you'll know, because I know I've had some constituents ask me about this, is I've started some preliminary discussions with uh, Manager Hall and Zedco uh, and some other folks uh, regarding uh, how we may be able to work to have a better municipal private internet, I don't know if you want to call it internet independence, but what can we do as a town? Because um, it would be a great economic development engine uh, and would be beneficial to residents, and we're very much in the, I just sent the email to Tom this week stage, so, uh, but we have started that. So, that's it. Thank you. Council Benedict. I just had a couple of questions for a town manager. I don't mean to jam you up with the question, but it's just that I haven't heard anything coming through emails or whatnot of recent um, right. Has there been anything done at 90 Broad Turn Road that you're aware of? Uh, today was the reinspection. Uh, we had uh, two code officers, a structural engineer, and the town's he uh, health uh, safety. Excuse me, the health officer, Dr. Stephen uh, Kirsch, uh, attended that. I did get a, just a quick briefing. Um, it will be probably a week or 10 days before we receive written reports from all of them. Uh, and I'll be certain to provide you that information when I have it. Okay. And my, my second question was uh, <clears throat> up on 22, I'm trying to blank what the name of it is, the trailer park. Mm -hmm. Just, yep. I wanted to know if they had brought things up the code? Yeah. 
I will defer that question to the town clerk. I'm just not uh, as close I'm to the licensure. Yeah. I the last communication I had from the code office, they had not. I know it was a conditional license they're operating under. I don't mm -hmm. recall what that condition was. We can research that, and I'll I'll respond to the full council. Thank you. Council of Blaze. I just want to say that I think the uh, uh, the new dog ordinance and the clover success ratio was outstanding, not only for the town but for the state. Um, I think overall the people that walked the beach were happy. People that took their dogs to the beach were relatively happy. Um, but I really want to thank the the monitors. Uh, I lived down at Higgins Beach, and I know those monitors were out there every single day. Uh, I'd see them, and great people. Um, they helped everybody. Uh, they, they instructed people. Um, they were courteous. Um, and, and also, I want to thank Ryan for doing an outstanding job pulling this whole program together for the town. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether Ryan's going to be around next summer, but I'll tell For his sake, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, the last discussion I had with him, I... <laughs> uh, that's it. Council St. Clair. I'm good, thank you. Okay, I'll, um, like I did earlier, I thank the um, committee for their work, hard work, and I um, was, well, there was such short notice on the um, uh, the barbecue for, to thank the uh, uh, beach monitors that I wasn't able to attend. I was really disappointed with that because as a council chair on behalf of the council, I wanted to be there to thank them for all their um, hard work and um, what they endured over the summer. So, unfortunately, I wasn't able to. I'll take this opportunity to thank them now. Um, <coughs> I believe I have a, a list of the emails. I'll be sending out an official thank you to everybody as um, soon as I can get to doing that. It's been a busy summer um, with uh, my wife having a broken ankle and two young kids and work and everything else, but I'll, uh, I will get to it. They're, they're owed that. So... Uh, I'd like to thank, and Brian, Brian also did a super job. Um, for, I think he put in more time than mm -hmm. he should have. And, yeah, for sure. Um, and a uh, real low paycheck. So uh, he definitely um, took some knocks, I think, yes. over the, the season. So, um, But we're all better off for it, I, I think. We've learned a lot. Um, I think we'll learn a lot again next year going forward. So, um, with that, um, what do you think about adjourning? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor. Aye.